This is the first of our four-part series about the Remembrance of Earth's Past trilogy. This episode is completely spoiler-free. It should help you decide if you actually want to read this. Also as a bonus, we discuss a movie, The Wandering Earth, based on a short story from the same writer. Welcome to the Three Ducks Problem Book Podcast. How are you, Pablo? <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> It has been renamed because officially we're not going to talk about anything else. We're not going to talk about Dune? <laughs> What no. are you talking about? <laughs> That's impossible. It's going to turn into the Dune Duck podcast in the foreseeable future. But for now, it's yes. the Three Body Problem Trilogy by Liu... Chichin. Chichin. Uh, I guess uh, maybe we should look on online. If that's we okay. Can that's okay. Let's just let's just, okay, let's just yeah. make as far as angry. I know, it's Chichin Liu. <laughs> okay. That, that's the name I usually hear. But All right. No. Yeah. So there's gonna be no dreams, no mysticism, no. no similes, no analogies, concrete facts, hard sci-fi, existential dread, <laughs> 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 <That's> and, and <laughs> Australia. <laughs> that's, too, that's that's later. That's, that's, yes. That's, that's, that's so fair. far in the future. But we are very excited to start this podcast uh, about this trilogy. That's one of the reasons we started recording this. And we wanted to like practice and do something simple at the beginning. That's why we picked the other books. Mm -hmm. So finally, we get into the into the thick of it. And mm -hmm. uh, there is me, Paolo, and the third duck. What is it? Who's the third duck? I don't know. <laughs> This existential dread. Yeah. <laughs> Despair and depression. <laughs> yeah. I th I think the the third duck is is uh, our hope, and it has left. <laughs> That's why it's not here. Okay. <laughs> That's why you can't hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So as you know, Paolo, as the connoisseur of despair, has been waiting for the depression books and has finally read them and just just finished yesterday. Yes. And I like, finished the third book yesterday. And when I was asking him during his first and second book, he said he's not sufficiently depressed. Mm. And then I asked him yesterday night and he was like, yes, I am depressed. Or you said, yes, it was depressing to be. Exact. Yes. Yes. But you were not depressed. Um, I mean, kind of, uh, just a little, but I think like to really explain it, I don't know how to do it without spoilers, but I feel like the main reason why I wasn't as depressed It was mainly because first I felt like little connection with the characters, mm. which I guess is one of the biggest. Yeah, the problems. characters are yeah. yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's one of the biggest problems over all of this this whole series. And um, the other reason was because the real like oh well depression hit me moment <laughs> uh, happened after like basically 300 pages of, of <laughs> depressing things <laughs> so it was kind of like uh, yeah. i don't know i have to say this trilogy broke me like okay it like destroyed me i don't know mm. what happened but i was like so so down in the dumps like so hard mm. i remember i remember that yeah i was like what the fuck <laughs> what does it even mean why am i here <laughs> what the hell yeah there are a few things where like Towards, especially towards the end of the second book, I feel mm. like yeah, it, it's mm, like it really crunches your dreams, especially <laughs> like yep. if you're someone who's interested in space exploration and like astronomy and these exactly. kind of things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it it kind of crushes your dreams if you're thinking about you mm. know the future and uh, the future of space exploration and everything else. But I was uh, at the time I bought a VR headset. Uh, yeah. The Oculus Rift, and I was playing a bunch <laughs> of games, and I got very sick from playing the games, and I was very sick from my stomach. And it was the same time I was reading these books, mm -hmm. and I remember very vividly I was at home, mm -hmm. and I got like really sick because I played Half Life Alex for like two or three mm -hmm. hours, and I got like really sick from my stomach. And then I, oh. I just finished like the second book or something. Okay. And I was lying on the floor, mm -hmm. and I was like, What is happening? <laughs> Why? <laughs> and Chen came home. Yeah. And she was like, what the fuck are you doing? Why are you here on the, <laughs> in on the, the floor? In fetal position on the floor? Yeah. <laughs> what the hell happened? <laughs> and I was like, I, I played games and I read the book. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happened. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is definitely one of the most memorable wise sci-fi series I've read. Mm. It doesn't. I don't want to say if it's good or bad, but I want to say I will remember this for a long time. Yeah, I think 
that it's definitely unique and it's definitely something that like it separates itself from most of the genre i feel like not not that i'm that much of an expert in sci-fi i don't want to say that but i do feel like it's um like the whole concept and mm. the the way the story is told um and the way it's structured is very very different from most sci-fi i've read yeah that's true yeah yeah so we're gonna try to uh do it a little bit different because this is like thick and like i said we've uh basically renames this podcast to the free duck problem it's a problem and it's gonna be long so we're gonna do like weekly episodes and it's gonna be like an hour long and there's gonna be whatever the fuck how many parts uh <laughs> ideally three for each book yeah but i don't think that's gonna happen <laughs> we'll i think see. so uh, we, we can we can hope no i said the hope has left then we can't hope <laughs> so uh i decided to do like Just impressions, no spoilers, trying to, mm-hmm. like, if you're listening and you're thinking about reading this, so hopefully we're gonna give you an idea if you're interested. Then we're gonna do, like, really mild spoilers if you still don't know if you wanna read this. And then the rest of it is gonna be just full-on spoilers because it's too much crap to talk yes. about. And also, we're gonna have a depression score. <laughs> so I'm gonna give points for each event that was depressing, and then we're gonna have a rating for each book based on how depressing it was. <laughs> That's what I wanted to do. Mm. And uh, so to start with, uh, mm-hmm. in general, like I said, this trilogy just broke broke me <laughs> on a subconscious level, and I buried this within my subconscious, and I was like obliviously happy. And then when mm-hmm. we came back to this, because I I'm a little bit removed. Pa- Paolo just finished this, but I read mm-hmm. it the first book I like a year ago, and then no. I finished like I don't know some time ago. Yeah, because I bought. I bought the first book uh, maybe a couple of months mm-hmm. after you had finished yeah. the the last book. So I got back into it and I wrote all the notes and I reread some some, some quotes and all this and I, it, it all came back, all these feelings. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> It's so bad. <laughs> so, how did you feel about it? In I do feel like it was a, definitely a worth read. Mm. I would say also, given the the length and the complexity, it was also an easy read. It's very easy to read, yeah. and then it hits you hard. And yes. I, I, you said it well, that this is very high concept, super amazing idea, mm-hmm. like, book, and very lacking on the characters. Yeah. Yeah, uh, lacking, like, it's lacking, like, good characters. There are a few, but um, I feel like this is a book that you should read for the concept and for some of the kind of, like, analysis of human societies and... Mm. Exactly. Like the roles of humans in in history, both mm. as a, individuals and as as a race, like as mm. a as a civilization. I think in that sense, it's it's really really well written. Mm. The ideas about the technology and the sci-fi, the yeah. science fiction itself, it's very very well thought out. Thought. Yes, yeah. And uh, this was done on purpose. Like the the author, which I guess we'll say more about him later, but. At the end of the second book, uh, in the in the version I read, there was a kind of like a final comment written mm-hmm. by by Chichin Liu, and he was talking about you know his experience with science and astronomy, and how he wanted to write a book which was about science, and while it is science fiction, he wanted to really ground it in real science and real like scientific meaning mm. um, n- definitely n- yeah not just like we go into hyperspace yeah, yeah, yeah. This and is, that's yeah. it yeah if, if you want to read about the, the the science of it then this is yeah. the book you want to read and uh, yeah let's get a little bit about into about like the, the writer and like when mm-hmm. it came out uh, in Chinese it came out in 2008 in mm-hmm. English 2014 mm-hmm. and it uh, immediately won The Hugo Award for the first Asian book that won the Hugo Award. Yeah, I think it was the first translated book hmm. to win um, to win a Hugo Award. Which is so sad. I didn't know. Um, I mean, <laughs> at the same time, it's not so surprising. I feel like in like sci-fi, kind of like fantasy, is one hmm. of those genres where like there are so many American novelists, and I feel like in other countries because the American novelists are so prominent, other countries don't get so many. Hmm. Like there, there's not such a domestic market. For them, like I, I don't know any Italian sci-fi writer. I know mm. some sci-fi writers, and usually they are not 
successful outside of Italy. Probably they got translated, but they're not like that successful. Mm. So mm. I'm not again. I'm not so surprised, but at the same time, yeah, it is a little sad that yeah. like no one else won before him. Yeah, I was very disappointed. I yeah. thought there would be other foreign books. Yeah. yeah. Well, the uh, person who translated it is uh, Ken Liu, mm. and uh, he he like incorporated some notes about Chinese history and uh, mm-hmm. like for international audiences. Yeah. Which is a big part of this whole ordeal because, of course, China censors books a lot. Mm-hmm. And I don't know much about this. And I don't know much how much they censored this and how much there's Chinese propaganda, whatever. Mm. I don't know much about all this, but uh, yeah. from what I've heard, his previous books were very intense on like the propaganda and like critique <laughs> and like being banned. And then on the other mm. hand, like having some little bit sketchy opinions about things, mm. which this book doesn't get into. So. You don't really have to, like, worry about that too much. Well, as I was telling you the other day, I feel like there was a big difference between the first and the second and third book in that yeah. sense. Like, the first book seemed more open. As much as, like, it was still in line with the, like, current uh, Chinese Communist Party view of, of, like, their own history and everything else. It Like, there were some clear critics to, to China itself. Um, in the second and third book... Uh, China just ceases to exist. Which I, which I, which I completely <laughs> yeah. like, didn't think about. And, yeah. and Paolo told me, I was like, oh yeah, they, yeah. they like talk yeah. about all these politics and all these countries. Yeah. And they, they never talk about China. just goes out yeah. of the picture, even though all the characters are Chinese. <laughs> mm. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah. yeah, It's kind of absurd. Like mm. all of the characters are Chinese, which is fine. Like, I mean, it, 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 it's kind of sad. The, the story is about humanity as a civilization and how in a way humanity comes together mm. or you know breaks apart uh when faces when faced with a crisis but at the same time all of the main characters are chinese mm. <laughs> all of the good guys are chinese yeah. and uh most of the incompetent people are um westerners which i mean again it, it's it's fine like in american movies the heroes are all americans and like in japanese comics everything everyone mm. is japanese i think like it's normal uh, yeah yeah That's uh true. but you know if would have been nicer to to have something different. Yeah. But, so I'm sorry we can't give you more background about the censorship, but uh, that's not really the point of this story, I would say. Yeah, I don't think so. Without going too much into the story itself, real life history is relevant only for the first book. Mm. From the second book, it's not really so relevant, so it doesn't really matter. Mm. Yeah, so that's all about that, which I... I'm very hesitant to even talk about because I don't mm. know much. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, very successful. So like we said, it won the Hugo Award. It was nominated like seven, eight more times and it won like three other awards. It's very yeah. successful. Yeah, it was and, very uh, successful. There's going to be a Chinese TV adaptation <laughs> uh, next year and Netflix is doing like a US adaptation. And so you definitely yeah. hear about this book a lot in the future. Yeah. And uh, you can watch the trailer. Yeah, so we watched it, so you didn't like it. Uh, I I don't know. I am perplexed. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't mind it. I was, like, happy that there is a sci-fi show where they don't focus on love and explosions. Mm. Like the new Picard, like, Star Trek show. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? I don't watch Star Trek. It's so painful. Okay. (laughs) Um, I will say this. This is not the first Netflix adaptation of Chi Chin Liu. Oh, I don't Uh, know. Sorry. Yes, there is a, a movie... Uh, based on a sh- like a novella, like I don't think it's a full full novel mm-hmm. um, called The Wandering Earth. Oh, I've heard. Yeah. Okay, which yeah. is a Chinese movie. It, I think it was the first story that made him famous. Mm. And uh, I haven't watched the movie yet, but I would like to. It, it seemed it Something seemed well done. Yeah. yeah, I'm kind of excited in the Chinese Chinese TV show of the adaptation. I think that actors mm. looked like I would imagine the characters kind of, and mm. I can appreciate that there is like a big production, non US. TV show about yeah. non-explosive sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Just before we move on to like the mild spoilers, uh, mm-hmm. to recommend it, I think if you like, for instance, Black Mirror, I think I would really recommend this. Like if Black Mirror okay. went into space. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> because it's depressing, but it's mm-hmm. not like depressing. It's just too real. Like it's yeah. it's like if you saw this happen in real life, mm-hmm. this is very highly probably how it would go down, and it's very concerning. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, yeah. I, I feel like sometimes yes sometimes of course not yeah. at all times yeah. but there are some ideas that, that hit mm. home like yeah. you know this this is how people are 
Yeah. And it's so concerning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, there, there are definitely moments where you feel like in a book you, you want to scream like, oh, this is so stupid. Why are the people doing this? And this makes no sense. But then if you look at it from a realistic point of view, mm. it actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Which I guess, yeah, it is one of the most depressing aspects of the, mm-hmm. of the whole story. I would also say this. I think it's a very good book for people who are into space things and mm-hmm. really want to think about uh, space exploration and, you know, uh, life uh, in other solar systems. But from a point of view where it's, like, really grounded in in real science Mm. and also which doesn't shy away from all the big issues that are kind of forgotten in most sci-fi stories, Mm. such as the distance and time. Yeah, yeah, that's true. There was something that is really interesting for me. I really like astronomy. I really like, you know, the the idea of space exploration. Mm, Me too. There, there were a few points where I always wonder about, like, yeah, you know, in movies, easiest example, like in Star Wars, okay. of course they go into hyperspace, mm. which, okay, like, there's no science. It doesn't, it's yeah, not it doesn't supposed matter. To be, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not supposed to be like a scientific uh, movie, but at the same time, you think about, okay, they can move so fast because they go into hyperspace, mm-hmm. but how they can communicate between, between planets, like, yeah. it doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. How can they communicate across the galaxy? There should be, like, an incredible delay. Yeah. If you're concerned about things like that, like, mm-hmm. if you're a moron, like, yeah, me, yeah, and you're yeah, worried yeah. About things like that, then this is a good book for you. Exactly, I absolutely yeah. agree. And you're definitely not a moron; you're just a person who thinks about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to like rest and have a dandy, like uh, super exciting adventures in space, this is not the book. Yes. Uh, like I said in the first episode of this podcast, mm-hmm. depression alert. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> depression <laughs> alert. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So we wholeheartedly recommend it for sci-fi fans. Mm. Stick with it. The first book is weird. When you start reading it, it's not difficult to read. It's not boring. Mm. It's not like off-putting. It's just strange. Like so mm-hmm. many things happen. Stick with it until the first end of the first book, at least, if you start reading. Yeah. And also, I feel like the first book, it, it really feels like you don't understand where it's going. Exactly. Of course, like for me personally, when I was reading it, I knew that there were two more books. Mm. So... I was kind of like expecting, yeah, it's the first book. Even if nothing really happens, Mm. it's fine. It's the first book and it's like to prepare for the other two books, which, by the way, are much longer, especially the third book. Oh, I didn't realize even. Uh, Yeah, like the first book is basically half of the third. Oh, I didn't know. Never mind. And um, it went by really fast when I read it. (laughs) (laughs) I wasn't really concerned with that. But I can't imagine like people who were reading the book uh, when it was being released. So they didn't know that this was the first book. I don't know. I feel like if you take it as a single book... Mm. It's, it's not that good. Yeah, like... The, yeah, yeah, exactly. N- like, nothing happens, basically. There is sort of a um, like, fun ending and yeah. all this, which we're already getting to, like, mild spoilers. But yeah. anyway, it's not a great book, the first alone. Yeah, that's the yeah. good point. Yeah, but by itself... Like, it wouldn't work so well. But it's a great setup for what happens in the second and third. So. Yeah. So I guess that's about it. If you're, like, not going to hear any spoilers at all. So yes. in, the, in the next part, we're going to get into, like, mild spoilers. By which I mean, we're going to just say, like, if you read the back of the book. Like, yeah. what, <laughs> like the synopsis of <laughs> the If book. you read the synopsis at the back yeah. of the book, you're not going to say any details. You're just going to say, like, in general, what is this about? So if you're convinced to read this, just stop now and uh, give it a go. I really enjoyed not knowing anything. When yeah. I read it. The speculation about what this means was yeah. enjoyable to me. Yes. And uh, I didn't even know like the meaning of the title at the beginning. I was no, like, three body problem. Me neither. <laughs> like, are there three bodies? Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like what happened? <laughs> like exactly. who, who's dead? <laughs> yeah. So let's get into mild spoilers and just talk about some general concepts. Mm-hmm. So there are aliens. So that's a thing that I didn't know that was in this book even when I started reading. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's like uh, the only thing I knew. Okay. I knew that there were aliens and I knew that there was China. That, so, that's the only thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So it's about an alien race and people and their relationships. And that's why yeah. it's interesting. In many sci-fi worlds and many sci-fi books, like the first contact is imagined in a lot of different ways. And in the book itself... Uh, several theories, like real life theories that were presented in the in like 70s and 80s are, are analyzed. And the one that is considered correct by the author of the book is one that says that 
because many people imagine that when there is first contact, humanity would kind of like unite mm-hmm. and converge. Uh, but according to the author, first contact with aliens would actually shatter humanity. Mm. And uh, not only like between different countries, but especially it would shatter kind of like their, their spirit. Because yeah, exactly. of course, as humans, we always believe like, you know, we are at the top of the food chain on our own planet. There doesn't seem to be an end mm. to our technological development. Yes. Especially like if you're born like in the last century, basically. So uh, first contact with aliens kind of like puts puts a big mm. question mark to all of that yes. and i feel like this is the main topic of exactly of the book of the first book yeah it gets into the real repercussions of this event and that's why it's good because it gets into what would probably actually happen mm. there are all these things uh, especially recently people are almost begging for aliens to come like have <laughs> you have you noticed i didn't know that there's all this like the government of the US have released information about UFOs ah, and all yeah, this, yeah. yeah and, and people are like, yeah, please, aliens, come in and solve our shit. <laughs> and they're like, okay, aliens gonna appear and it's gonna unite us and the, the world will come together and planet Earth will cooperate and yeah. and everything's gonna be dandy and then, okay, they're gonna solve our technological problems and give us like... <laughs> So, so that's like, and people I've seen on Twitter and on social media, they're like, yeah, aliens come, yeah, it's amazing. So yeah. <laughs> this book talks about this exactly. Yes. Yes. So that's yes. why it's very relevant for yeah. now nowadays culture, mm-hmm. I feel like. Mm-hmm. And, and that's also why I think it's so popular, because people have mm-hmm. this feeling that people are almost like counting, counting down the mm-hmm. time when aliens are coming, which is insane, because there's no reason for it at all. Yeah. Well, I feel like it's because like, and I think the same happened, like, in the 70s for the same reason. Like, in the 70s, like, there was this fast, uh, like, the race to space and, like, mm-hmm. this fast technological development when it came to, like, space exploration and everything else. And because humanity had reached that stage, mm. people started to expect, well, we reached this stage. So, of course, now it's when the aliens will appear, but, like, there, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's it's, absolutely it's a, no reason for it's, that. It's very selfish to think that. <laughs> yeah, and... Um, also, there's the whole thing with the Fermi paradox, which is... Which is also explained in this book. Yeah. And that's yes. another thing that's very clever about this. Yeah. And it's all in a very elegant way, a very, to me, a new view on this whole thing. Yes. So this is about the second book. So I don't want to talk too much about it. But I, I just want to mention, because this is maybe my favorite thing about the whole okay. trilogy, is uh, in the second book, when they talk about the Fermi paradox and the Fermi paradox in this like in this universe hmm. and it completely blew my mind because <laughs> I mean for, for yeah. people who don't know um, what the Fermi paradox is it's inspired by Italian physicist oh okay Enrico Fermi <laughs> oh okay I didn't who's know. the uh, inventor <laughs> of, of radio it's inspired by him because the idea is we can catch radio signals and we can observe the universe and you know there are so many stars and so many planets uh, that the um, probability of other intelligent life is extremely mm. high yeah but despite that we can see absolutely no sign of alien life yeah so, shorter yeah in layman terms rate. why aren't they aliens when there is such a strong probability that there would be yes That's exactly all. there are a lot of scientific explanations for this of course these are all theories mm. the the one they find in this book mm. was if not realistic very compelling <laughs> yes it, it was extremely interesting and it made so much sense it was terrifying but it was also so as you said i mm. think elegant is the best word like the solution to, to the paradox was so elegant yeah so one last thing in this mild spoiler section I want to mention is to explain why we keep saying it's depressing. <laughs> like, I asked Paolo to uh, write down uh, disappointments he's experienced in his life. Yes. And why did I do that was uh, that this book was another one of those. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, so on my list, I wrote down mm. that uh, one of my uh, like life disappointments uh, by which I mean a truth that you learned and was like, oh, this is this is this is true. Like when you you know this feeling, mm. you like you learn something really true and you cannot yes. do anything about it. And one of those things, as an example, yeah. for me was that my parents don't know anything, like mm. no, everything. Sorry, not anything. <laughs> like, <laughs> like you know, when you're growing oh, up okay. and you, you look up to your parents mm. or to somebody, or you have an idol, and then. You're mm. like, oh, they they are, they are, they are just people. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you're like, oh, they're, they're idiots. <laughs> yeah. Which, by which I don't mean parents, but I mean like, uh, okay. Yeah, like everyone, like uh, mm. they're normal people. So that's um, that's one of those like hard truths that we're like, yeah. ah. <laughs> yeah. One of my biggest disappointments um, in life was actually very much related to this, to this story, which is I wrote like I'll never go to space in my notes. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
yeah, maybe that's true. Maybe that's not like it's not true. Like it's not so relevant. What I mean by that is, the more I study about space, mm-hmm. and the more we learn about space, the more I understand that, for example, the whole idea of humanity moving to different solar systems is mm. impossible. And yeah, that's another of those truths that you learn. Yeah, like, like the, uh... you learn that like physics has hard limits, mm. and there's just nothing you can do. Mm. Like it's not a matter of like, oh, we need to find a technology. No, no, mm. there's no solution. Yeah. This book is like really focuses on that, especially in the third book. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, one of the most relevant point for the third book is l- hard limits of physics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's really like a high concept sci-fi, which those disappointing mm-hmm. moments are in there. But I yeah. found many disappointing moments for me, like despair, ex- existential dread inducing. <laughs> like another like hard truth I wrote down to prepare was, uh, even though you try as much as you can and you do everything correct and there aren't any mistakes or drawbacks, yeah. you can still fail. Yes. So that's another thing we learn. Like yeah. it's, it's like, okay, so I did everything and this happens in everybody's life. Yeah, uh, I had something similar, which is other people are better than me. <laughs> I mean, that's true, because like when you're a child, like yeah, you, you yeah. don't know your limits, mm. right? You, you just feel like, like for me personally, like the idea was always like, if I'm not the best, it's because I'm not working hard enough. But then you start to realize that just some people are just better than you. And mm. like, you can play basketball and train <laughs> as hard as you want, but yeah. some people are just better and you will never be better than them, even if you work 10 times harder and mm. it's just a bullshit <laughs> okay <laughs> you can like that's, that's, yes yeah i agree i mean I agree. of course hard work is is important mm-hmm. um, i don't want to undermine that but yeah other people are better than you yeah so mm. just to give an example why we keep saying it's depressing so in this book these kind of feelings were mm. so often yes. <laughs> i was like damn <laughs> yeah i feel like yeah especially in the second and third book so i have uh, mm. i have marked down which i meant which we cannot <laughs> say in this multiple section so I hope this gives you an idea what we mean. And uh, if you want to know what we mean mm-hmm. specifically, tune in for the next episodes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the next few episodes. And there's one last thing I wanted to talk about this. Uh, I wanted to go on like a crazy man tangent mm. and uh, do like a thought of the day. I'm insane. This is not the, the spoiler. It's just inspired by what happened in the book. I'm not going to say what happened in the book, but it's very relevant. Mm. So if you if you just want to be like super up your ass about spoilers, just stop listening now. But I'm not going to say what happens in the book. I'm not going to say what concept was in the book. I'm just going to say like what I f- what it made me think about and what mm. kind of conclusion I came to absolutely separated from the story in the book. But uh, it got me thinking about cuteness and Japan okay. and like uh, the compartmentalization of of safetyness, which sounds insane, but in in life we try to be in a group that's beneficial or safe or like okay so you have like a family and you know your your parents won't kill you of course so then you have Hopefully. this then you which even that doesn't happen sometimes but okay <laughs> <laughs> and then you get your friends and okay you can trust them and you get your job and you trust them and you keep like expanding this bubble of like these people are fine and sometimes mm-hmm. in society you can meet people who you have never met and there is always this moment even in modern society where you're like is he dangerous like you, you can mm. you're walking on the street and there's a guy or somebody who you don't know or you didn't expect comes into the room so mm. everybody looks and there is this like check is he mm. dangerous like can yeah. he be here are we safe and it got me thinking like a lot about this in relation to japan and i felt like japan somehow maybe is trying to solve this and I don't know how intentionally. Hmm. And it might be just because of all this cuteness overload bullshit in Japan. <laughs> because I felt like I never thought about cuteness in the meaning of being safe. Like, if you hmm. think about men and uh, relationships and dating. So in Japan, uh, men are very feminine. Like, they have very, like, nice clean clothes. They have, like, clean shaven. The, the macho men mentality doesn't exist. Hmm. And yeah, it's much like more underplayed compared mm. to to Western countries, and even more with girls. Like girls, like sexy, cute is sexy. Like, like cuteness is what you're looking for. Yeah, and I think it might have happened because in Japan people love rules so much, and they like the societal like uh, safety. Like everything has to be completely relaxingly like fine all the time in Japan. There is mm. all the rules that they have to follow, and they like following the rules because it makes them safe, and they can just focus on the job or. They don't have to worry about this danger element. Mm. And I feel like the cuteness is symbolizing it's safe. Because if you're a person who's a man, mm-hmm. who 
displays himself as being like cutesy and like clean and nice and overly like feminine, mm. then you're saying that you're not dangerous. You're not gonna punch people. Okay. And the same with the women and with the products and with the characters. <laughs> We talked about this with a student in a lesson and she was like, I like uh, Snoopy and Moomin, so these cute characters. And I was like, let me show you Czech characters. And, sh- and she was like, mm. yeah, I like this little mole. And uh, if you're curious, just search little mole Czech Republic, you'll find it. He's very cute. He can come to Japan. I was like, excuse me, he can come to Japan. <laughs> 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 and then and I, and I showed like, we have this ant, it's called Ferdam Ravenet. And she was like, oh, he cannot come to Japan. <laughs> And, and he's not cute enough, so he's okay. dangerous. And in the West, we have the mm. opposite, because men want to show that they're sufficient, they will survive, they will endure, mm. and they will be free, and they will like be stronger. And that's the opposite mm. of this mentality. And that means they're dangerous, and they... Yeah, mm. yeah I, I never thought that deep into that. I guess it makes sense, in a way. Um, I feel like it's not necessarily true for the whole society, but it is true that there is like a strong play on the cute part of things mm. in terms of like um safe and acceptable mm. yeah i guess that is true because life would be so much easier mm-hmm. 90% of things we do wouldn't need to exist if we mm. knew people's intentions for sure so the whole like discussion dating meeting fights mm-hmm. disagreements it's all because you don't know what other people want Yeah, that's true. If you knew for for sure what people wanted, it wouldn't exist. And that's so, yeah. so, like, <laughs> what the fuck is this? So if it didn't happen, it would be so easy. And I think Japan is, like, pushing in, in this. Like, they want this to happen. They want people to be so, like, cutified and, like, tamed. But at the same time, that, that, is, that is very much, like, as a, like, exterior thing. Well, I feel like that based on the rules and the mannerisms and all this politeness, they might think you're a bastard. They might imagine <laughs> they're killing you, but they mm. will never do anything in Japan. Like people mm. in Japan, they just don't do fights. That's just not uh, a thing. Yeah, it is true. And I think it's, I mean, it, it is true that there is much less of the, oh, oh, you looked at my woman the wrong mm. way. I'm gonna go there yeah, and yeah, punch yeah, you. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> like... Yeah, I feel like that that is much much less common, which is great. I, like, <laughs> I really hate the whole idea of macho culture in mm. in the West and uh, how you know there's always this this thing where like men are supposed to be like super sure of themselves and mm-hmm. like always ready to fight mm. uh, for for whatever. I hate reason. it too. But, yeah, and I hate Japanese yeah. rules and how up there are are like people living in Japan about polite and following the rules and not doing the wrong thing. But mm. this opened my mind a little bit it was kind of eye-opening in the sense that maybe this is the way mm-hmm. to make the society less conflicted yeah again like I, i feel like especially for men i do think that like um removing the side of like toxic masculinity and uh, removing this side of like men have to be muscular men yeah, yeah, have yeah. to be this and that yeah, yeah i just wanted to get this off my chest because yeah. that's what i've been thinking about a lot while i read this that's cool uh, I was yeah like... I, i didn't make that connection at all i understand why you did compared like related to this book but mm. like i i didn't think about that at all it's very interesting so i don't think you've been spoiled so don't worry about that <laughs> So I think it would be it would work if we ended the first episode here because we've already done like 40 minutes. <laughs> okay, wow. And uh, I think this is like a nice introduction if you right. if you don't know what this is, if you want to decide if you're going to read it or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, usually at the end we read a quote, so I'm going to read a quote in a bit. But uh, I think that works. So first episode, intro on the trilogy, and then hopefully three books episodes. That's good. It would make four in total. Yes, maybe that works. So it, uh, <laughs> it become a four yeah. problem. Already four problems. Yes. <laughs> so two things I want to oh, say. Oh, maybe the problem is we don't know how to count. Yes. So speaking of counting, mm-hmm. perfect segue. I wanted to mention the name in Chinese, uh, which is uh, or in also Japanese. Mm-hmm. It's uh, the kanji for three, and then there is the kanji for the counter. Mm-hmm. So it's like in Japanese, if you don't know, if you count f- stuff. Uh, there is different words for different kinds of things. If you count apples or dogs or things, yeah, it, it's a nightmare. So, is it in Chinese? I'm not sure. I guess so. I so, don't know. So the uh, the title in English is the free body problem, but in the original title is like the free things, and the things is the type mm. of a body. Yeah. So that's more interesting. Yes, I, I think so. Like, uh, yeah, the two characters are like the character for three and the character for body. Mm. Yeah. So in Japanese, that's sunbon. In yeah. Chinese, I'm not sure. 
<laughs> Probably we wouldn't able to pronounce it anyway. So. And to end, I'd like to read you what the free body problem in orbital mechanics means. Yes. <laughs> Because we Which, I mean, yeah, it. it's quite relevant. I'm gonna paraphrase yes. to make this easier and shorter, yes. but uh, you might be wonder- wondering if you still don't know what it says. So it's a problem of taking three initial positions and velocities of three objects, three bodies, and solving them for the motion of them. So. Uh, simply said how are things going to move in space when there are three of them and each of them has a certain gravitational pull yes which is in yeah go ahead oh, oh okay so <laughs> I was I was just, to say yeah, something just confirm me <laughs> <laughs> from, from the height of my professional knowledge yeah. <laughs> of physics <laughs> and mechanics which uh, comes up a lot in the book and yeah. uh, it's no secret that there is no solution there is no elegant solution there is no formula there is no equation To describe this, it's so difficult, you cannot do it, and the only thing you can use to solve it is just brute force, like numerical, like throw data at it and then find a solution. Yes, so it is quite interesting because in recent years, some Chinese uh, mathematicians have hmm. been working on this, and the uh, most advanced solutions have been found by these mat- Chinese mathematicians, hmm. who have been doing something very similar with what actually happens in the book, hmm. which is essentially that they are, instead of trying to find an equation to solve the mm-hmm. the three body problem they are using essentially machine learning so that they have these computers who are running simulations over mm-hmm. simulations over simulations so that they are trying to find patterns and solve as many cases as possible but again it has basically been proven that even if you can find like a like an incredibly high amount of of solutions mm. you can't f- predict with certainty you know the solution to to the problem yeah So that's it for the intro. I hope you got something out of this. I hope we helped you to decide if you're reading this. <laughs> and in the next few episodes, we're gonna get into the books. And all of those are gonna be just full-on spoilers. So if you're not reading this, please join us. If you're reading this, please wait until you've read it. <laughs> and hopefully it's gonna give you some more insight into the story and the book and stuff. Mm. So just a quick bonus on this episode, because we mentioned the movie from uh, Chichin Liu, The Wandering Earth. I have no idea how, what the name is in the Chinese, <laughs> but that's beside the point. I watched this movie, I came back and decided to warn you guys to never watch this. It's awful, <laughs> but still very entertaining. I still enjoyed it, I have to admit, but it was like, it was in, this movie is insane and not in a good way. And uh, I would like to briefly tell you what happened and hopefully stop you from watching this because it's really long. The premise of this movie is that they install giant engines on Earth and shoot it into space. They like propel Earth into space to find a new home. Why do you ask? Because the sun will explode. Why is the sun going to explode? It's expanding. Why is it going? Why is it expanding? There is no, nothing's explained in this movie. I'm sure it's explained in the book, which is uh, <laughs> which the movie is based on. It is also a short story. The book is, uh, yeah, it's not not a full. Oh, it's a short story. Okay, so I would like to give you like a short impression. This is not gonna be like a discuss everything in the movie. I just wanted to tell you how ridiculous this was. So full <laughs> on spoilers for the Wandering Earth from 2019. <laughs> And uh, the movie starts, and it looks beautiful. Like the CGI is great. Like the, the engines on Earth and the shots of the space and all the like spacesuits, I love it. And even the actors were not that bad. And then it all goes downhill. Like every ten minutes of the movie, it goes so much worse, and it devolves into into just trash. It's <laughs> so bad at the end. <laughs> But the start. They talk about like what will happen when we start moving Earth, and what will happen with the surface of the Earth, and what will happen when the Earth stops moving, like rotating. Mm-hmm. So they install engines around the equator to stop the rotation of Earth, and then they install bajillion engines on one half of Earth, so they can like <laughs> aim it, like steer it in space. And then they just shoot Earth out, out outside of the solar system to a new solar system where they can start orbiting a new sun. Right. And that's how they save Earth. <laughs> so that's the premise. So when they start moving Earth, a bunch of 
stuff happened. So what would you imagine is a problem when you start moving Earth away from the sun? Well, first a lot of earthquakes. I would, exactly. I would guess like climate drastic changing exactly changing the whole climate. earth is frozen mm. that's yeah. that's this happens in the movie and there's also giant tsunamis giant uh, well, yeah. flooding because when the earth like jerks and stops rotating mm. all the water all just the water pushes moves. everywhere yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous it's like when when you have a tray with soup and you suddenly stop yeah yeah so they don't explain any of this they just say oh earth is just damned because the surface is uninhabitable now it's frozen there is water everywhere earthquakes everybody's dying so we have to build this giant mm. underground cities where people have to move but there's not enough space so we're gonna mm. do lottery and if you don't win the lottery to go underground you're, you're just done you're finished sorry bye and they kill like half of the population this way uh i have a question if Like I, I guess, like moving Earth itself is like an incredible challenge. Like using the mm -hmm. engines powerful enough to stop the Earth rotation, and then moving Earth to another solar system. And besides, mm -hmm. like you know, keeping life in these underground cities and everything else. Why are they doing this instead of building just spaceships? That's what they exactly discussed in the movie, and they were like, "We don't have time to build spaceships because But they have take... time to build." Underground cities yeah. and, and <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Yes. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> also, um, I guess. So that's one reason. Other reason is they haven't found a suitable planet to colonize, so they need to take our planet with them. <laughs> It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, it's it's nonsense. So yeah, that's that's the answer. Yeah. My question was. I, I guess. I was watching this. Mm -hmm. I was watching the movie, and it was all going down, and it just started to like fly away from the solar system. I was like, "Excuse me, did you forget something? Excuse me." <laughs> Did you forget something? Do, do you know what I'm thinking about? Uh, the moon? And yes. I was like, excuse me, where is the moon? <laughs> excuse me, did you forget the moon? Where is the moon? <laughs> I guess that's not <laughs> such like... a big problem. Like, if your engines are moving the Earth out of the out of orbit, I guess the moon would stay there because I guess it depends on the... I mean, I, I'm not, of course, a physicist or anything, but like the moon it orbits Earth, but it's also pulled by the sun. I guess if the yeah. Earth is moving so away, so that could be an interesting plot point. Yeah. Like, where does the Moon go to? Uh, free body problem and such. Yeah. But so the Moon disappeared. So this is kind of like I'm willing to go along with it. So they they just start moving Earth, and there's all these problems, and they keep mentioning the lottery and how people have to die mm -hmm. and all this, and it's a big drama. And then they keep mentioning the dark side of the Earth, like you mentioned, and it's it's forbidden to go there, and it's super scary, and nobody ever talks about it again, and we don't go there. I guess it's explained <laughs> in the short story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I guess. So then the plan, because they found a solar system with a new sun, but they can't go straight to it because they don't have enough fuel or the engines are not powerful enough, whatever. So the plan is they go to Jupiter and they swing around the gravitational field to speed up Earth. Yeah, it's called uh, not a gravitational sling or something like that. I think that's, that could yeah. be it, gravitational sling. Yeah. So... You might expect this. Engines break down and the Earth starts flying in a bad course to crash with Jupiter. Interesting. So you, so this is the whole premise. So mm. they don't even get there. Nothing else happens. The mm. whole movie is about not crashing into Jupiter. And there is a bunch of subplots in the movie that are super annoying. <laughs> there are these like teenagers and children, and they teach they teach them how to drive like trucks on the frozen surface of Earth. And the trucks you drive mm -hmm. by holding a sphere and you like rotate it and it's all sci-fi. And the c CGI effects are super, super bad. Like the oh, wow. space scenes, amazing. Mm -hmm. And all the trucks and all the cars on the surface of frozen Earth is all CGI. Okay. And it looks like a video game. <laughs> it's so bad. All right. So anyway, they they like start getting closer to Jupiter and Earth is just falling into the gravitational field of Jupiter. And they have uh, malfunctions of the engines. Mm. And the whole plot starts to be about repairing the engines so they can like start them up again and move away from Jupiter. <laughs> yes. okay. And at the same time, there is a space station flying in front of Earth mm. to check for problems and then report back to Earth and make sure that they don't fly into something. Mm -hmm. And on this space station, there is the father of the main character, the annoying teenager on Earth. Right. And they keep having like father-son drama which is very uninteresting and very artificial. Okay. And 
on this space station they have embryos of many people and all the seeds of plants and all the food and basically if earth just goes to hell they can use this space station to still save humanity <laughs> but they couldn't make more of these of course it was easier exactly, to move earth. exactly yeah okay exactly interesting so anyway they uh try to repair this core and there's this whole part of the movie where they drive in these trucks and everything falls on them earthquakes everything explodes it's just so bad <laughs> okay <laughs> and then they fix the core but it doesn't help because it's too late and earth is just flying into jupiter so what is the solution to this movie how do they save earth they want to blow up jupiter <laughs> And the explosion of Jupiter will propel Earth away from Jupiter. Uh, oh, oh, okay. All right. So how do you blow up Jupiter? They say that the atmosphere, it's mostly hydrogen. And in the meantime, the the atmosphere of Earth is being sucked away. Mm. It's like a nice effect to Jupiter. And there's a bunch of oxygen. And it's mixing conveniently with the hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And somebody's like, I know what we'll do. We'll light a match and ignite this tunnel of like hydrogen, oxygen, and it's gonna blow up Jupiter and Earth's gonna explode. Everything explodes and we we'll fly away. It's perfect, perfect plan. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh -huh. so how do you do this? It's 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 gonna get worse. This is like okay. this is going like so bad and it's it's gonna be even worse. And then they're like, okay, so this engine, so we're gonna change it to a, a beam. Like the engine is very mm -hmm. wide, so we're gonna focus it and have like a fire shoot up in this like cloud of mm -hmm. oxygen hydrogen and it's gonna explode so they reprogram the engine there's a scene where they have to push a bunch of shit in somebody dies it's super drama and then it doesn't reach the thing to blow mm -hmm. it up and everybody's like oh no we're we're dead and there is an international uh, announcement go home and die peacefully <laughs> goodbye there's nothing nice. to do <laughs> and everybody's there's, like scenes where people are crying going home and and they have a scene where Everybody is like in their home and in, uh, like people going home in their cars and there are different nationalities mm -hmm. and it's like Indians and Vietnamese and Americans mm -hmm. and Chinese and everybody says something and they're like, oh no, we're gonna die. And because it's a Chinese mm -hmm. movie and nobody spoke English, somebody literally says like, if I was voice acting and somebody says literally, oh no, oh my God, we're gonna die. Oh no. This is how they say okay. it. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like the, the English, English actors in Squid Game. That is much worse. <laughs> really? It's much worse. Can it be worse? There was a, there was also a scene where somebody was like crying and fighting, and in the background there was like an American mm -hmm. guy, and he was literally saying like, "Oh no, what are we doing? Oh no, it's bad. Oh my <laughs> god. Oh no." He was fucking like that in the background. Awesome. <laughs> I'd like to have that role, please, next time. There's yeah, a yeah, it was movie. probably like the ALT at the local, like elementary school. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> this all fails. This plan fails, and the final ending of the movie to, to light it on fire how, how do you do it i don't know smoking a lot <laughs> <laughs> they fr everybody throws a cigarette up yeah. in the air and it ignites it so the guy in the space station who is the father fights the ai of the space station that's trying to make him go to sleep mm -hmm. because he's violating some rules and uh, he fights cameras on the space station by throwing bottles of vodka at them and lighting it on fire because his co-worker was Russian and he smuggled a bottle of vodka in his okay. spacesuit. Of course, he's Russian, so... And there's like this whole drama, he kills one camera, destroys one camera, and then a new camera like slides in and the, the AI is like, oh, I have new cameras, you, you don't stop me, you can't stop me. This is so it's stupid. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it gets worse and the movie ends with him somehow talking them into allowing him to use the space station to light up this thing to explode it which is the yes. stupidest thing doesn't make any sense and they told him like seven times you can't do this and suddenly you can do it they don't explain why mm -hmm. they changed their mind because there's hope i think they say there's okay, hope which is like yeah classic movie explanation yeah. for something like oh yeah we are convinced now because so they say okay you have control of the space station now go save <laughs> humanity and how does he save humanity how does he explode jupiter He flies the whole fucking space station into it and kills himself with everything on the space station. Nice. So everything explodes and all the like plan B humanity will be saved. Mm -hmm. Colonization Earth exploded. What the fuck? So Jupiter explodes and the Earth 
survives. They okay. don't even show because it. Because the thing is, like, if Jupiter explodes, I'm pretty sure that nothing will be left of Earth. But and I was like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and the father died. The, the the space station is just in pieces. And Earth is just flying away from Jupiter. Somewhere. The engines are broken. They don't awesome. know where they're going. And they they can't get to the new solar system. Nothing makes sense. No, Nothing is addressed. Skip to four years later, and the guy who was the teenager is like now an established somebody who drives trucks, so <laughs> I don't know, and everybody's happy. And there is a party, and everything's great, happy ending, and nothing is explained. Happy <laughs> ending. And that's, that's the end. <laughs> it's like, awesome. Like, so that was something. I hated it. I hated the ending, like the beginning. Yeah, fair enough. I can understand why. So, yeah, that was just a quick... I will cut this down, hopefully, to something shorter. And yeah. uh, <laughs> don't watch this. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty insane. Yeah, the elements were interesting, I'm sure. There were some good ideas, but the movie was just drivel. Mm. Blockbuster, trash, <laughs> and nonsense. So thank you. Thanks for listening. <laughs> thank you for not watching. Thank you for not watching. Don't watch this. And see you in the next episode. <laughs> The following episodes will come out weekly, one for each book in the trilogy. We deep dive into the story and try to explain it for those who haven't read it, and also do a therapy session for me because I felt really crushed after reading them. I'd recommend listening also as a recap before reading the next book. Thank you for listening, please rate us on Apple Podcasts and see you on the next one.